Hi, good afternoon, first additional language and home language. Um, we are going into week three. Today is the 14th of August. It's a Sunday and I decided I'd get the canned recording going so we can upload and you can get going with this week as well. So yes, it's a very bleak day, lots of rain, wind, um, chilly. Um, I'm hoping you're all staying safe and keeping warm um, and that you are enjoying the new start of the semester and you are still feeling very uh, motivated and positive after we see how you're all feeling. Let's see if that can change somewhat. I hope it does. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, let's get the PowerPoint up and going. There we go. Slide check. Okay, so as you can see, um, we're into week three and it's selecting and designing appropriate language resources. We're still on grammar. Um, we're going to look at assessing next week and then um, that's in week four, which is basically going to be a Moodle, which is a task online for you as well. And then that'll follow with the um, going on to the writing section, then on to critical language awareness, which is the last section of the semester. Yes, week three, but let's see what we're going to do today. We're going to look at English resources and um, how we can make our language teaching more contextual and more communicative in the language classroom. Yes, let's just go back to how you're feeling. I'm combining this for TFF, TFS, THF, and THS. Um, so I'm going to give you both things and how you're all feeling. Okay, so I went in today onto Menti, and um, I think it's about 34 of you for home language that have completed it. And we have this big group on the word cloud that are excited, but with many, many negative words surrounding them and they're big words. So that means quite a few of you said you're tired, you're nervous and you're stressed, anxious and overwhelmed. Quite a few negative words there. Um, there are a few motivated, um, thrilled, which I'm very glad about. Um, focused, determined, enthusiastic. So we do have a few of you. Um, interesting words were frazzled. Um, not sure why you frazzled. Hopefully it's not just because of English that you frazzled. Um, and cynical. I've also got a skeptical. So I'm not too sure what you are feeling cynical about. Maybe the course, maybe about other things. But um, a strange place to be, as well as being skeptical. Not too sure. But let's try and get those positive vibes going. Um, and that's the only way we can get through this somehow that's how you got to be in the classroom got to put the show on show does go on um so just keep positive listen to the kahoot um yes here's our top 10 moha that was me <laughs> i was at the top of the pops um which was 12,448 um followed by tss, you got 12,283 all got 10 out of 10 and it all goes on timing and the top third one was ab with 12,229 going right down to b um, there's top of the pups and there's b who came in 10th um with 11,562 so it's on how quick you do it and how many you get correct so this was the final scoreboard um i think it closed one o'clock today the 14th of august with me on top then you second then ab and one is up with sheer and alex well done okay so there's a star for all of you Yes, let's look at TEFF. Let's see how you're feeling. Um, and TFS. Again, we have this like group <laughs> with both positive and negative feelings, with from excited and happy. We've got that group, and we've also got the worried and the nervous group. And then a lot of surrounding words that are quite intriguing to look at. Um, I've got a word here, a, a little message here to me. Please be fair this semester too. Um, is that saying that I'm unfair? Um yeah, I'd like you to chat to me about that because we do strive for fairness always. Um, and if we're not being fair, you need to get back to us and chat to us about it. Uh, that is one thing that is is your right to do. So just think about the fairness. Um, English is stressing. I hope it's not just English that's stressing. That makes me feel stressed. So I'm not too sure why it's stressing. If you're unsure of anything, you're anxious about something, please get back to me. I do answer you. I'm not that horrible. Um, I'm already drained. So week three, not even started, and you're feeling drained, although we've had a long weekend as well thrown in. But I hope you're feeling a lot more motivated, this person. And frustrated, yes, already frustrated. Let us know what we can do to help to ease that frustration. Um, thank you for those who are positive. I love positivity. Um, I'm happy to start. I'm so glad you are. 
Um, um, I'm grateful. I'm determined. Um, I'm better prepared. That's such a hopeful thing to say that you feel that you're more in line with what's expected of you, that you're eager, that you're responsible, that you're thankful, that you're dedicated. So thank you for the positivity. Thank you for those that are excited. And thank you for those that are happy. It's really nice to work with a group of people that are more positive than negative. So let's try and get those positive vibes going. Okay, um, let's look at the task again. Yes, we have um, week one completing tonight at midnight. I went in and checked um, Canvas this afternoon. Um, 67 FETs and you're in the black now because at least half of you have nearly completed, just more than half. And SPs are 86 of you and 40 so also gave you black because nearly half as well. So um, week two is still going to come in. So well done, yes, thumbs up. Week two is still going to come in so you can still see they write down but you've got until the 21st of August to complete that. So nothing to be really worried about at this point. For the um, best additional language, 59 FETs, 23, so I've given you the black as well, although only five of you have done week two, but you've got till the 21st. SPs, there are now 108 of you. Um, I gave you black, although it's it's just under a half, but that's okay. I'm sure more will be doing it. And um, 12 of you have done for week two already, which is great. Um, someone said to me that I'm um, from SP, um, if there's additional language that you couldn't access the quizzes, I've checked as well. They've all been published. I could access them. So um, if there's anyone that's battling to access, please get back to me as well. Okay, so quite happy about that. Um, and I know the rest of the results will improve as well. Okay, so let's look at unit one. We've completed weeks one and two, looking at language structure and use. We've looked at integrated grammar teaching strategies. The link from the Zoom last week has already been uploaded. Just go onto online courses, click on um, link, quick link two, and it's on there by the online courses. You just have to click on the link. It's not a video that you can see. It's the link that you have to click on. Um, what about grammar teaching and how we should complete grammar, co um, teach grammar in the classroom? Um, so that grammar does not give too many problems. Okay, this week we're looking at appropriate resources to make language more integrated. And we'll look at a few grammar games as well and other techniques. Finishing off, there's our resources. Finishing off the following week with a Moodle, which is an online um, activity, which you will have to do. Um, you will not have me recording, which you might be grateful about. And that's also from chapter 13 in Ferreira. Okay, so let's look at resources. Um, we're going to go back to CLT again. This is, and also the um, online tracking will also be around CLT and grammar teaching, communicative language teaching. And um, why do we keep keep on coming back to this in the classroom? Because there's no real set format for a CLT class. Um, all lessons just have to have the underlying principle that we're using language to communicate. Okay, as long as you're making meaningful communication in the target language, that is CLT, communicative language teaching. And that's the underlying principle that we're using language in the classroom to communicate meaningfully. Yes, they're all talking and chatting together. And to use authentic material. So whatever the text might be, whether it's a visual text, whether it's a spoken text, whether it's a written text, whether it's a listening text, it must be authentic. It must be related to something that's a theme, that's interesting, that's relevant to your students. Um, and this will determine the language that they are going to learn. And we can look at different kinds of texts now, and you can see what they could learn from those texts. So for teaching grammar, teachers should give the students meaningful input through context. So how are we going to study adjectives? Not that we're going to get the rules about adjectives. That's a describing word that describes a noun. We're going to give them text and they're going to create text so they might learn how adjectives or nouns are used in the text. So we're going to give them opportunities to put grammar to use so they're going to have to do it. I'm not going to tell them they're actively going to do that. Um, I'm going to relate gr grammar to real life situations. I'm going to look at a picture. We're going to describe what's happening, real life situations, real life use of language. Not like this student lesson on the board. There's teachers standing there. Teacher's got the poor student in front and he say, she's saying to him, what are we teaching? And he says, uh, I'm not sure at all. And I think many students actually feel like that. And the learner in the class also says, that, what am I learning? Okay, 
that might be the whole saga in all language classes, but hopefully by using CLT practices and meaningful teaching, your students will not feel like this, hopefully. Okay, so looking back to CLT principles um, from Richards and Rogers in 2001, the key principles of CLT is that it must be communicative, that you're going to speak, you're going to use the language practically. It's task-based and you're going to be doing something. If you don't do something, you're not going to learn anything. And it must be meaningful. It must be relevant to your learners as well. So language learning requires active meaning-making in the classroom. So if your students can, cannot sit passively in the classroom staring down at a book or piece of paper. They must be doing something, whether it's chatting in groups, whether it's doing a task, whether it's making a speech, but they are doing something. And this might be group work with this collaboration. They're talking together. They might be solving a problem together. They've got to be critical about what they're reading. They've got to analyze things. They've got to be writing for a reason. Responding to real materials, like you for assignment one, you're looking for a some kind of report that's persuasive, that's got a social message, that's topical this year, um, load shedding, whatever else, what else is happening. Um, COVID's not so big anymore, but maybe wearing masks, shouldn't we wear a mask? Um, a colleague of mine has just gone back to UAE and they're wearing masks there all the time. So thinking about that and debating that. And also the higher order cognitive tasks as well. Um, not only the remembering and comprehending, but also the creating, the analyzing, the synthesizing, um, the evaluating are so important. Go back to CAPS. You're going to be looking at these CAPS for assignment one as well. Go and look at the cognitive levels from literal to inference to appreciation. And how do you put that into tasks? So learner and learners into tasks are relevant and meaningful to the learners, they're relevant, the material's relevant to them, they can relate to it. Um, it's contextualized, it's not separate from what they are doing, they're reading about it, they're writing about it, they're listening about it, they're speaking about it, and it's not taught in isolation. We're not talking to have a whole list of adjectives which we're going to circle that is not contextualized learning of grammar. So you're going to have individual work, yes, you must have individual, but you're also going to have also independent work, but you also can have pair and group and information gap activities and research different projects, questionnaires, writing up reports. Those are so relevant to our students as well. This is quite an interesting um, learning pyramid that if you look, what is the average learning rate? So if I'm only, like I'm giving you now a lecture, you're only going to retain 5% of what I'm telling you. That's why we have the online tracking tasks that so you've got to actually go and interact with the material as well. If you're only going to read something, it's 10%. Audiovisual, this is maybe a bit more, you're getting 20%, you're retaining. If I'm demonstrating something, it's 30%. So if you demonstrate something in class, now we get down to group work discussion, 50% you'll retain. Practice by doing. So your teaching practice, very important, 75% is learned. And then when you teach others how to do something, it's 90%. These are your retention rates. So if you have a look at this, showing the pyramid again. The first from lecturing to demonstration are regarded as passive teaching methods. 5% from lecture to 30% to demonstration, whereas participatory, when I'm working with somebody, I'm interacting with them, this is going to lead to more retention by your students. So from group discussions, how important that is, to practicing what they are doing, to teaching others the most richest experience for retention to understand that. So if you're just doing all the lecturing, not much is happening in terms of retention for your students. So let's look at the resources for CLT lessons, okay? So we're gonna use real life situations for our communication. Um, if you look at this little cartoon, there's a teacher talking about the auxiliary verb and she's saying English interrogative constructions on the board. Now, isn't that boring? Okay, then she starts lecturing her students. The auxiliary verb, which normally appears after the subject, must move to sentence initial position. What does that actually mean? First students in the class are saying, what's a verb? Okay, so just remember, we don't teach grammar in isolation. If I can just reinforce this all the time, we don't teach grammar like that. Okay, big cross, we don't do that. So the lesson should follow the four C's. Um, curriculum, which is content, meaningful content, communicative, we're going to be using the language meaningfully, cognition, we're going to use in different cognitive levels, 
creating, not only memorizing and understanding. And we're going to think about culture. What, what is relevant to our students? What is meaningful to them? Um, if they have never been to the sea, possibly you would go, you wouldn't do a piece, a lecture on, or sorry, not a lecture, um, a study of diving, because they would not even know what you're talking about. But if someone's living at the sea, you can speak about fishing, maybe you can speak about diving, you can be swimming, the beach, all those things become quite relevant to them. Yes, communication is the key. Then you always try and include, integrate all the four language skills, not just only reading, but reading and speaking, or reading and writing, reading and listening. Um, and you try and integrate all those skills together in the classroom for your CLT class. Okay, there's all the skills you're going to use in the class all the time, constantly. So I think there's five here as well, examples of how we can use CLT in lessons. Um, the first is to look in at adjectives, how we're going to include adjectives, which is part of our parts of speech, word classes, how do we use that? So the prior knowledge would mean that they would have to know what a common noun is and what a proper noun is. Okay, Most of them would know that from primary school, what common nouns are table, but what a proper is, is the name of something like Abeja, okay, Cape Town, KZN, those proper nouns. Then you'd ask them to bring some interesting photographs or pictures to class, okay, something that, and they could even take their own picture and bring it to class, which might be interesting. Um, yes, there's an example from a newspaper, someone um, in, the, in the game reserve and the elephant is resting his trunk on the car, right, so that's the picture they bring. So what do we ask them to do in pairs? Um, we ask them to write five interesting sentences about what's happening in the picture, okay? And then they must go and underline all the nouns that they've used, the car, the elephant, the tree, um, the window, whatever it might be, the man, the woman. Then they're going to they're going to insert some describing words. So they might say, the elephant put his trunk on the car. Elephant, trunk, car, all your nouns. Then what about the trunk? elephant the big elephant put his heavy trunk on the blue car so then they're going to highlight all the adjectives used all right so they've done the task five sentences identified the nouns inserted adjectives then they're going to add more details um to write a descriptive paragraph so they've got their five sentences then they're going to add more details then what they're going to do they're going to exchange their paragraphs and underline the adject adjectives used. Okay, so I'll give you my my send my paragraph that we've written, and then the person will go and underline. They will underline the adjectives. Then they're going to return the paragraphs, and you're going to collaborate in pairs, checking this, and then you're going to read your paragraphs to the class. You can also go and extend this as well into other paragraphs. So. The final activity was, would be independent activities where the learners would write a descriptive paragraph using their own picture. So maybe you'll give them one picture to do this with, or maybe different pictures, but then they use their own one to write their own descriptive paragraph about it. So these are just different pictures. These are the floods in KZN. Um, you can see how terrible it looks. There's still more flooding that's happened last week in, I think it was in Buffalo Bay in East London. And this was for Women's Day, um, five interesting sentences about that using nouns and adjectives. And yes, also um, our soccer players, I think they also did quite well. Um, you could write about that if that's your favorite sport. Okay, here's another example on how we can use sentence structures. The other one was just looking at adjectives, it could be the same for looking at prepositions for, for nouns, for ad adverbs, whatever you'd like to do, any kind of word class. This is the life of Pi. Um, it's a movie, I don't know if any of you have studied it, it's about um, Patel, P. Patel, he and his family come from India, um, they decide they've got a zoo, but things happen in India, and they decide to leave to go to Montreal in Canada, and they catch a, a boat with the animals, which they're going to go and sell um, in North America, or in Canada, I'm not too sure, but while on this um, Japanese ship, the, there's a huge storm, ends up with everybody drowning, but Pi manages to find safety in a lifeboat along with this Bengal tiger called Richard Parker. Okay, so they, they might know the story, but you might have to give them a bit of a background or a clip on it. And now you can see there's the Bengal tiger. You give them an extract from the actual movie. Um, the ship sank. Um, it made 
The first sentence you put bold, so the language is the first sentence. The ship sank. It made a sound like a monstrous metallic burp. Things bubbled at the surface and then vanished. Everything was screaming. The wind, the sea, the wind, my heart. From the lifeboat, I saw something in the water. I cried, Richard Parker, is that you? That's the Bengal tiger. It's so hard to see. Oh, that this rain would stop Richard Parker. Richard Parker, yes, it is you. I could see his head. He was struggling to stay at the surface of the water. So what happens, um, you will then cut this up into sentences and give each group a sentence, this a envelope with all the sentences in, and in groups, they're going to have to try and re rearrange the sentence into meaningful discourse. They'll begin with the sentence in bold. So you will have the, the, the transcript, you will cut it up, and they will arrange it into sequences, looking at meaning and coherence and cohesion within those sentences. Um, so there we are. What happens in the movie is that the Bengal tiger gets into the lifeboat and he's stuck on this rafty like thing. Um, he eventually has to make friends with the tiger so that he can get they can share this boat together. And I think they're at sea for 277 days and have many adventures and um, before they are found. Okay, so that's basically the story. The story goes on. Um, so you could do different sections, different groups have different sections. Um, all about the life of Pi. You see the ship going down. You see them trying to make friends and save himself from Richard Parker, the Bengal tiger. Okay, you can do the same thing with poems, dialogues, prose, interviews, cartoons. Um, so this whole thing of sentence structure, cutting things up, putting them in groups, and they put the sequences together. And then they could walk around and go and check each other's to make sure that they agree that that it does make sense. Okay, and give report backs. Um, example three is making predictions, and this is using movie posters. So if you're into movies or you like movies and you can get hold of movie posters, it would be quite nice to go and visit the different movie theaters. Um, so you get two or three movie posters or more, put them up on the wall for a few days so students can have a look at them, um, print copies of movie reviews relating to these. Um, yeah, we've got The Great Gatsby. This is often a set work, so you could use that. There's Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio that was in this one. Um, and there is Twilight Breaking Dawn, that series as well. And here is James Bond, um, Daniel Craig, and Skyfall. So these are two, three different kinds of genre movies. So you'd have these posters all over the class. Um, so in the first worksheet, um, this will be individual. They will study the posters carefully. And for each poster, they'll write sentences on what appeals to them about what they like about each of the posters and what they do not like about each of the posters. So they would have to go around and compose sentences on what they like and don't like. And then they've got to select which one they like the most. So I like this one, I like this one, this one, I don't like that one. And finally, what I do like the most and why I like it. Okay, so all those kind of little paragraphs and sentences they could write. Then they would go into the group work um, and they look at movie reviews. And yeah, they can work in threes. Um, and then they'd have to select the genre that each movie belongs to, what what kind of movie is, is it? So what visual details suggest that it is this kind of movie genre? So if you look at Daniel Craig, which is an action spy type movie, um, why, what details are there that suggest that this is an action spy? Maybe you have in the pistol, lying in this, in this position, 07, all those things could suggest it. Um, we've got here, the, the um, Twilight series, Breaking Dawn, and that could be like a young adult fantasy, also a bit of a horror movie, I would say as well. Um, and why do I say that? Because of the, the ghoulish looks of the vampires there, the black and white, the darkness, the witches, that's, that area, that scariness that you've got there with the mist and all that. So the visual details. And then you've got The Great Gatsby, which is a historic romantic um, drama. And why do we say historical? Because you can actually see the the I think it's the 1920s what they're wearing type of suits and dresses the headgear um old-fashioned that type of thing and you can see obviously it's a romantic because it's females and males and love scenes and all that so I said the the Breaking Dawn is also a bit of a romantic drama but it's also a bit of a horror in it and they call it an adult fantasy romance okay so then you discuss your responses to that um what do you think each movie is about? So you're predicting about what they're going to be about. What is 
um, scaffold going to be about? What is twilight breaking dawn? What is great gaps going to be about? Why do you say that? You've got to use evidence that you can see, not because you've seen the movie, but what you can see in the actual visual um, and which movie would you like to watch and why would you like to do that? So you've got to discuss these kinds of things. Then you're going to look at the reviews and you're going to then decide, does the reviewer like the movie? Does he favor it or she favor it? Is he neutral? Why? Why do you say that? So you're going to look at each of the reviews that you found and you're going to think of reasons why whether it is a good, bad, or what, whether the reviewer likes it or not. And this one, he says, um, parents need to know that the Twilight Saga is a must-see movie, okay, for, for any fans, teens or otherwise. So he's obviously promoting it, really likes um, the fact that any age group can go see it. Although he does say further down, um, there's one long sensuous love scene with close-ups of bare skin and faces and a glimpse of the side of Bella's breast, but nothing more graphic than that. So if you don't mind your kids seeing that with a few passionate kisses, then that would be fine. Um, language is minimal, so there's not much language there. And it's all part of the series as well. Uh, what about Great Gatsby? Do they like, does the re reviewer like it or not? Here we go. He says, I'm not here to praise him. Everyone has already done that. I just want everyone to act like him so obviously really likes the acting of Leonardo DiCaprio um as Nick in The Great Gatsby he didn't really like Daisy he says she's a shallow useless woman um one of the most confused creatures with a mind of their own um so you can see possibly really likes the main character but was very demeaning on Daisy let's go and have a look at Skyfall and he says um the newest installment Skyfall Oh, sky high. So really likes the, the new Sean Connery or the Daniel Craig. Um, he says it's one of the best movies that he's seen. Um, it's an, another excellent outing by Craig. Okay, so there you are, Daniel Craig. Well done. So then they must examine the language carefully. There's your model that you're going to use again. Remember, we spoke about last, last week, we spoke about models. You use these reviews as models. Um, how does the view of... Twilight Saga um, and Breaking Dawn differ from the other two? In what way is the language different? In what way is the structure different? So think about that. Um, haven't you, after you've read these reviews, um, are you still convinced that you'd still like to watch that movie you chose in your previous thing? Maybe you're not wanting to watch it anymore. Maybe you do want to watch something you didn't want to watch and then give reasons for your answer. And your application, again, is always the individual, the independent part where you choose a movie of your own choice that you have watched on Netflix or at the movies and you write a review on it. So there's different types of tasks you can do this. Can you see how communicative it is, how integrated it is, how you're using material that is relevant, how there's discussion, but it's also independent and individual learning within the class as well. It's all about language, it's all about meaning. So we're on to example five with um, CLA, critical language awareness. Um, Language always has issues of power, inequality, social justice, and identity. And in your assignment one, you're going to look at this very critically in the social discourse with the use of pronouns like us and them, um, negative words, positive words. So just remember that language has got power. And if you look at this, there it is. Language is a superpower that you've got because it often shows the power of your identity, your race, your ethnicity, your social status, your religion, um, your gender as well. So it's you can make statements about that, which shows it can be very powerful in the way you speak to people. So teachers should enhance learners to become critical about language. So this is why we, we do in the contextualized assignment one in this way, so that you can think critically about the use of positive or negative words. And you can think critically about the style of the writer. Is it formal or is it informal? And this is from CAPS. And these are all the things that you should address for CLAs. Go and check the CAPS document. It's all there. Um, from facts and opinions to know the difference between them, direct and implied meaning. What do they really mean? Denotation and connotation. All the way down to stereotyping, bias, discrimination, language varieties, purpose, and interpretation of literacy, which you're also going to visual literacy, which you're also doing in assignment one as well. So this whole list of things to become critical about. Um, this is one interesting way to look at critical thinking model 
So especially when you look at how the words that are used, possibly in different speeches, and there's lots of speeches you can go and check out. Um, this is last year when Robert Posa made the 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 speech about we're going to um no longer have um the no longer ban alcohol and cigarettes. Do you remember when that happened? Um, I think it was towards the end of last year. And this is a model to generate critical thinking that you could use. The first thing you could use is to describe things, and that is the who, the what, the when, and the where. What, when, who, where. Um, and then you can analyze when you can ask things like, why did this happen? How did this happen? What if this happens? And then to evaluate it. So what next is going to happen? So what did this happen? What if that happened? So those are words you could use to steer your students into thinking critically about something. Obviously, the description is very much more the lower order. But as we get onto the analysis and the evaluation, we're moving up cognitively. So how do you frame your questions? Um, we can look at word clouds now. There is a link here at the bottom where you can go to www.wordcloud.com, which does all the work for you to determine what words are being used. So if I go and look at Ramaphosa's speech, and I'll paste those, that text into word cloud, it forms this kind, kind of word cloud. And you can see the bigger words are the ones used the most often. And you can see Ramaphosa, lockdown, South Africa, people, holiday, alcohol, Suleiman, um, gift to the givers also comes up into there in COVID-19. And you can do it into the shape you like. So I did shape of Africa with another one of his speeches. Um, and you can say, I will be able to. So this is our, the, the word of all our politicians, they will and what they're going to do. And does it actually happen? But yeah, you can see these things like vaccines, violence, businesses, um, South, need, people, rebuild, economy. So it's all those words that go into it. Then word cloud also gives you a chance to, to have a list of all the big words. And these are the bigger words in his speech from South Africa all the way down to can. Okay, we can do this. And then you can see Jim's coming to it, COVID-19, travel, infections, lockdown, all the words. Also gives you the smaller words, the lowest, smaller print there. And these are the smaller words going all the way from unemployed down to midnight when it's going to end. And then you can see words like pandemic, curfews, flattens, economy, maybe the things he said less about and the things that he said more about the bigger words. So what I went and did, I went and looked at Ramaphosa's speech on, on Women's Day, and this is an excerpt from his speech as well. Also went and pasted it onto Word Cloud and I put it in the shape of a woman. There she is. Um, you can see all the words he used and you can see South, South Africa, women, men, also feature there, afraid, problem, woman, violence, young, support, and schoolgirls also feature there in the words, okay? And you can also then go to Word Cloud and get a list of the most words that are used, bigger words, right down to the least amount. And you can see it goes from 40 words, he used the word woman, then he used South Africa, the next amount, then men featured quite a lot there with many problem violence, the most words. So you can see what his speech featured. So this is how you can see in terms of critical language awareness to be aware of the words that are being repeated because that gives the context of the message. And this is quite a fun way to deal with anything. So they could type out an essay and they could paste it into word cloud and then they could see the kinds of words that they are using. Or they could take any article from a newspaper and do the same thing. So it's quite a fun way to look at words and vocab. Right, this is grammar games quickly which you could do any time in any class to finish off a task, to start a task. Um, this is quite nice how you can expand sentences. You can start with one sentence. We stood outside for 20 minutes. Okay, one sentence. Now you can say to them, add in an adjective somewhere in that sentence once they know all about adjectives. We stood outside for 20 miserable minutes. Okay, they'll be describing what kind of minutes. Then you ask them the question, when? And if you can see all the colors, your students like doing that. So you can give them all the arrows and you can get them to do this themselves. When did we do it? This morning we did it. Where did we do it? This morning we stood on the sidewalk in front of the school for 20 miserable minutes. How did you stand? This morning we stood shivering, okay, on a snow-covered sidewalk in front of the school for 20 miserable minutes. And then why were you doing this? And then they can extend it with saying, this morning we stood shivering 
on a snow-covered sidewalk in front of the school for 20 miserable minutes while the fire chief investigated the cause of the fire alarm. Okay, there's the whole story. But it's a very fun way to do something like this and to extend one sentence, showing how a sentence can be extended. This is a way to hook your reader. Um, if you're going to be writing something, you could start with a question, okay? Who left tiny footprints in my bedroom? You could start with the emotion or feeling. A man's face was beat red and his screams were very loud. What about the sound? Ring! Exclamation. Oh, no. Complaint. No, I will not spend another summer at Aunt Mari's house. What repetition? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so these are lovely ways to start an essay, a description and an adjective. So these are ways you can hook your reader. Um, also quite a nice thing, you could do this weekly in your class and you could get different groups to do it. So on a Monday, it's Monday mistakes. You could have a whole lot of things with errors in it and they can go and correct them. Tuesday terms, they're looking at the word accentuate and bombard and they could give meanings for these words, interesting vocab. Wise words from William Shakespeare when he says there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Okay, to discuss those wise words. Thursday thoughts, at what age do you consider to be old? Do you think age is just a number? And get them to chat about that as well. Figurative language, there we go. There's the simile and personification and discussing that. Um, and then you can do, the next week you can get another group to do it. So you could have different, different groups doing different things and things to discuss in that day. This is a grammar game with throwing the dice again, which is quite fun. Um, if you get one, you've got to list three coordinating conjunctions. If you get a two, what's the difference between an adjective and an adverb? And give one example of each. So if you really like um, rules, you could actually do something like this. Name three subordinating conjunctions if you get a six and a four. So then if you, it depends on how many dice you are playing with and what you can do with that. This is just a fishing game, which is quite a nice icebreaker. Start the class with it. Um, you pull a six, the fish, fish number six would be, what is something you're very good at? Okay, then you'd have to say what that is. If you pulled out the nine, what's your favorite part about summer? Okay, the sun and the warmth and the light. Um, what food could you eat for 99 days in a row? So what do you really like that you would eat every, every day? So that's quite interesting. And yes, um, what's one thing you want to learn this year? So depending what number you pull out and you put this all in a fishbowl, pull it out and have a chat to start your day off when they can talk about different things. This is a, ga a game, possibly for a grade eight with Mighty Joyce, or well, who knows, maybe Matrix would like this as well. And um, the teacher's got a ball and she throws the ball at Tando and she says, Tando, and she throws the ball. And then he's got to say a verb that goes with it. Tando runs, Tando sleeps, whatever it is. Then Tanya throws the ball at a classmate and he says to the classmate, they, so they've got to use the same word as he used. So he said, Tanda runs. Then he, they must say, they, they run or they sleep, they speak. So they're using this whole concord to get the right element to, to verb agreement with the subject. Then you can add complexity. You can add adverbs, nouns, adjectives to this whole ball throw. It might be a bit chaotic. Maybe small groups do it might be fun as well. Um, yes, verb uh, agreement to subject. Um, do they agree? You've got different cards. Do you say my dad uh, and I don't like bowling? Or do you say my dad and I doesn't like bowling? So depending on whether they get the right answer, they can move up the, the game like snakes and ladders. They can get there first. And then yes, just a prefix game where you've got all the prefixes in the, in the game and you've got the different cards. So if you get uni, unicycle, um, if you get the word X, exterminate. If you get com, complete. So these are ways you could do games to do your prefix game. And this is just um, basketball with nouns. Um, you've got to know your common nouns, proper nouns, what isn't a noun. And you've got to pick, throw the ball in the right place, whether it's a noun, proper noun, not a noun, or a common noun. Okay, getting to know people. You can also ask them different questions. Your, the teacher or your buddies can pin a name of a famous person on your back. Um, I watched The Voice, so I thought I'd maybe use um, Sally, uh, what's her name? Uh, Miley Cyrus, Miley Cyrus. Um, then we've got Nick Jodas, 
we've got Kelly Clarkson, obviously, um, John Legend, and we've got um, Gwen Stefani and Blake Sheldon. But I'm just using these. You can use anyone that they would know, and you pin the name on the back. And then the learners have to ask their peers questions about this person. Um, like, does that person play sport? And the person would say, no. Is the person a scholar? No. What type of music does he play? Okay, so you can ask questions about it without actually giving away. And then the names are not revealed until everyone has come to some kind of conclusion and the learners are given a chance to reveal who they think they are. Okay, I think I'm a famous singer or whatever it might be. It also can be interesting to put the names of different people in the class on their back and they can actually try and work out who they are. Um, also, you can ask each group to bring a picture showing some kind of action, a man running down the street, a child crying, a couple chatting. He has a picture or an action picture, possibly from a, a war movie, um, showing different things that are happening. Yeah, someone jumping off a cliff. Yeah, there's a crowd demonstrating boy on his back so you've got a picture showing some kind of action happening and the teacher writes on the board what happened next on the board then the group discuss and express suggestions about it and then they can answer using words like yesterday the boy rode his bike to the shop this morning the boy is riding his bike to the shop after falling off his bike he no longer rode his bike anymore from 2 p.m he will not be riding his bike tomorrow he may ride his bike. So you can actually write different sentences based on your picture. And that'll give you all your tenses. Okay, we're coming on to the last part of my, my, my can recording is on the discussion forum for this week. Um, if you go look at week three, you'll see that you should write a post of at least 50 words on the question you'll be given. There's four different questions. So First additional language, SPs and F, um, FETs will have different questions. And the same with home language, you, everyone, there's four different questions. You will have to write 50 words on your post. And then you've got to respond to at least two other posts with 25 words at least per post. So you write one and you reply to another, another two. It's all about teaching grammar rules. And it's all about comp communicative language teaching. So you've got to answer one question. Um, these are the questions. Um, I'm not too sure which ones it is there. When you go onto your week, you'll find out. Um, the first question is, why is teaching a grammar rule and then following up with practice an acceptable CLT teaching method? So it's we've all discussed this. So if you go back, I think in week two, you'll see the answer there. Or you can go and Google it, whatever you want to do to get an answer. Question two is, why is discovering grammar through meaningful communicative interaction often not practiced in a language class? Why do teachers not use this way to discover grammar in communicative interaction? Why does that happen in the classroom? Third question is, why do CLT approaches focus on language fluency rather than grammar accuracy? Why do we be talking communicatively? Why is meaning making more important than gram grammatical accuracy? And then how can you contextualize grammar in the language class? Okay. So depending on who you are, you'll get one of those questions. Write 50 words on it and then respond to two of your classmates, what they've said about it. Okay, so what's next? Um, week four. Um, we've just looked at um, grammar and how we can get resources and how we can use it communicatively in the classroom. In this cartoon, it says, the boy says to his mom, mom, me and Lawrence was going. No, she says, Lawrence and I were going. Then frame two, he says, anyway, we seen. And she says, we saw, correcting him. Third frame, well, you know, them guys who, no, she's saying, those guys. What's your speech, Michael? In the last pair of last frame, he says, she says, now, what were you going to tell me? And he says, I've got, but you can see all the errors that would be made there. So we, we all love English. It can be fun, it can be enjoyable, and it can be meaningful and communicative as well. We've looked at different resources, um, how we can use language and grammar in the classroom as well in a very communicative way. And we're going to look at assessment of grammar, which you're all doing as well for assignment one, because you've got to do the marking guide. How are you actually going to mark those questions that you have designed? Okay. So take care, have a good week. Um, hope those of you that are stressed and frazzled and um, cynical and uh, skeptical and uh, what else were you? All of those. I hope you feel a lot better and you join the positive vibes um, of being encouraged, um, happy, 
contented and those positive things. Okay, so bye for now. Enjoy the week and whoopsie, stay safe. Trying to get out of here. Stop share. Okay. Still there. Okay, I'm going, really going. End it, there we go.